You're listening to BioTalk with Rich Bendis, the only podcast focused on the biohealth capital region. Each episode, we'll talk to leaders in the industry to break down the biggest topics happening today in biohealth. Hi, this is Rich Bendis, your host for BioTalk. We have a little different format today, and we actually have a three-way going. And two individuals that know each other very well are going to be interacting, talking about some entrepreneurial education programs, some tech transfer out of the University of Maryland in Baltimore, and also entrepreneurial emerging biohealth company within the biohealth capital region. So two great guests today, and we'll introduce them each to you. Neil Davis is the director of post-baccalaureate programs in scientific and medical entrepreneurship at UMB. Neil, welcome to BioTalk. Thanks for having me, Rich. It's great to be here today. And our other guest is Howard Carillon, who is CEO and co-founder of Coaptech. And Howard, welcome. Thank you for having me very much. I appreciate it. You're welcome. I think we're going to start today for our listeners, for each of you to personally introduce yourself, talk about your backgrounds, which will give a little bit of perspective as to how you got to where you are today. And I'm going to start with Neil Davis. Neil? Sure, Rich. I've got an interesting background. I started off with a really traditional career, engineering, MBA in finance, worked for a bunch of public companies for about 31 years. And then about 16 years ago, I made a right turn in my career and began to work in the innovation community here in Maryland. First with the Emerging Technology Center's incubator up in Baltimore. And then from 2014 through 2019, with TEDCO down in Columbia, where I was part of their seed investment team and also managed some really interesting entrepreneur support programs. I retired from TEDCO full-time at the end of 2019, and back at the end of last summer, joined the University of Maryland, Baltimore as the program director for this new post-baccalaureate certificate. And we're going to learn a lot more about that new program, which is going to be very unique from what I understand will be one of the first in our whole region of that type, Neil. So we'll learn a little bit more about that program when we come back to you. But I want to start with Howard and also give him the benefit of introducing himself to the listeners as well. Thanks, guys. So my my story is is a little bit windy, but I'll try to keep it as brief as possible. By background, I was sort of slated to go to Wall Street. I studied economics as an undergraduate, and all of my colleagues in undergrad went that route. But family is important, and my father happened to be a a federal prosecutor for the SEC, and he sort of saw the 1% of the 1% of Wall Street that was a little bit underhanded. And so he he sort of warned me, you know, Howard, you may not want to go to Wall Street. It's got some characters there who, you know might not be the colleagues you're looking for. Around the same time as I was figuring out, you know, what I wanted to be when I grew up, I had a set of personal experiences. And I tell people I got into medicine the hard way. I had a family member very close to me with a very serious diagnosis. And I spent a lot of time in and around the U.S. medical system. And through those interactions with that system, and I mean, inpatient, outpatient, ICU, insurance, the wheel, right? All the way through hospice even. And it's sort of a secret, right? It's, it's a quiet secret. It's, it's sort of inside baseball. But I think from the outside, people think the U.S. healthcare system is a well-oiled machine. And that's a good fantasy and a good perception. But it, it's got a lot of room for improvement. And it's got a lot of need for folks who are willing to roll up their sleeves and, and try to help make it a little bit better. And, and I thought I might be able to do that. And so after some of these family experiences, graduated with my degree in economics and started working at Johns Hopkins as an analyst to help prove some of the economic value of things that had been clinically successful. And through that opportunity, I started working with doctors, nurses, pharmacy, IT, you know, the main players on the field. And I loved it. I loved that interaction of multidisciplinary thinkers trying to solve very tough problems to make people's lives better. And I took to it like a duck in water. People appreciated me with my skill set, which was very different than, you know, what the clinicians had. And I eventually got the opportunity to start leading teams and to begin sort of broadening what I was doing. And 
through that set of experiences, I, I met a lot of brilliant docs at Hopkins. I was leading a few projects and on one of those projects that had gone pretty well and I developed some, some very trusted relationships, a doctor named Stephen Trapello approached me and said, Howard, I've got a new technology I'd like you to take a look at. And I said, Steve, what is it? And he shared with me that it was a new way to put in feeding tubes. And that's sort of the first thing that Coaptec, our company, is, is pursuing. And it's just a funny world. And, and he didn't know this, but you know, my family member, who I mentioned earlier, had a feeding tube, a really important stage in her life. And I said, Steve, I, I know that therapy and how it can really help people who need it. If you've got a better way to do it, I'm all ears. And looked at it. It checked all the boxes medically. It checked all the boxes from an economic point of view. And we decided to form the company in 2016. And it's been off to the races ever since. So I'll share more about what Coaptic is and what we're up to. But that's sort of how I got to here. And there were a lot of interesting stops along the way. But uh, that's the short version. Well, Howard, thank you for that intro. And I'm going to flip it back to Neil. Neil, you recommended that we do a three-way with Howard on this podcast. So Tell me how you met Howard and what the relationship and interaction has been. So we met back when I was at TEDCO. TEDCO supported Coap Tech through some of the grant programs that it offered. And when Coap Tech was putting together its large seed round, TEDCO had the opportunity to invest in that seed round. I led the charge on the TEDCO side. Got to know Todd Howard, got to know Stephen, got familiar with the technology, saw all the good things that Howard just mentioned about Coap Tech, and we actually invested in that round. And since then, I followed the company. I love what they're doing. And to me, it's a great example of a university tech transfer. It's not a heavy, long-term pharma story. It's a shorter term, although Howard wouldn't think this, but it's a shorter term metal device story. It really, really touches all the right buttons. And the other thing that really interested me about the company was that Coaptech did a fantastic job of tapping into so much of what Maryland has to offer young startup companies. And I'll let Howard tell about that, but it's a great case study. That's a good flip back to Howard. Let's talk a little bit about your tech transfer experience, the creation of Coap Tech, and some of the Maryland ecosystem programs that have enabled you to continue to grow. Thanks, Rich, and, and thank you, Neil, for the support along the way, truly. And we've benefited from so many different programs and, and interactions that we've had in this ecosystem, and we continue to do so. So the the starting point, though, like you mentioned, Rich, is the the tech transfer adventure. And so Dr. Trapello, as a good citizen, he invented this technology while working at the University of Maryland downtown. A patient had pulled out their feeding tube and he, that night, conceived a way that he could help replace or place new feeding tubes with ultrasound, which is a technology that's changing medicine. It's become ubiquitous in everywhere from top tier ICUs in, in the developed world to you know rural clinics in other parts of the of the world and, and ultrasound has become very affordable and also very high quality. And until Dr. Trapello's Eureka moment, there was no way to put in a feeding tube with ultrasound. You had to go to surgery and it was sort of a mid-level operation. So he's he's developed a much less invasive way to do it, a much more affordable way to do it. A lot of great things that he disclosed and shared to the University of Maryland, Baltimore. He filed a patent in 2014. And so we're now in 2021. It's, you know, just to put some bookmarks on things, it's, it is a long journey. And Neil, even though, you know, you might think it's quick from the outside, but he's been working on this for, for now seven years and started as an idea, grew into a garage prototype through a very early stage one TEDCO grant. And it progressed through a number of different tests and other milestones on its way to FDA clearance which we received in 2019. So for any entrepreneurs out there thinking this is going to be an 18 month journey, you know, I'd like to caution you and help you think about the long term. But, you know, the tech transfer experience where it all kicked off was challenging. Tech transfer is, you know, notorious for being a difficult negotiation. And the reason being is that the entrepreneur has 
not as much leverage as the, you know, the university that's holding the goods. But there are a lot of people in this region who want to help make things happen. And that is absolutely what we found when we were starting this process. So there's a great technology. You've got now a founder and a co-founder who want to pursue it. And you need to go sit down with the team and talk about how are we going to set up a deal that can benefit both of us now and over the long term. It's pretty involved. And so I think our negotiations took maybe six months. We were patient. The University of Maryland was also patient. It's not something that I think you want to rush through because there are a lot of different paths that the future can hold, whether, you know, ultimately this gets picked up by a big strategic, whether we become a big company ourselves, whether it turns into a licensing venture. You need to sort through a lot of that. And again, you need to do it without a lot of leverage and without a lot of the conventional things that you would learn in business school are wins in your sales from a negotiating standpoint. But we found the University of Maryland to be very fair since it was only Dr. Trapello and I founding the company. We elected to, you know, there are sort of levers you pull and, and it's a little bit of a hydraulic. When you push one down, another one will rise, you know, in these types of negotiations. And the two primary economic features at play are really equity in the company and a royalty rate on future sales. And we were able to balance those in a way that I thought was, was really healthy. We were able to give up a, a little bit more equity on the front end because we only had two co-founders. Some companies have five. And we were able to drive down a slightly lower royalty rate, which we wanted to do because I think we ultimately believe that a bigger company is going to pick this up at the end of the day. And that royalty rate will travel as the technology portfolio does. And so if a big company sees a, a really high royalty rate, we might not be attractive as as a target for an acquisition or, or an exit. A lower royalty rate makes it easier for a big company to come in and say, you know what, we're the right group to really bring this to the world, which is where we hope this technology can go and can make that transaction a lot more simple. So we decided to have it be a little bit more challenging of, of a negotiation up front. Hopefully that will pay off on the back end. We'll see at the end of the day. But the tech transfer process is one that I would just tell any entrepreneur is worth it. It's something where, you know, you'll certainly need legal representation. You know, you're going in a little bit with your head in your hand and your, you know, your communication with the university is about your credibility. That is what they are assessing. And that's what they were assessing in me and, and in Dr. Trapello. I was a first time founder. And so I think there were, you know, there were some legitimate questions about was I going to be able to deliver the goods and take this te technology, which the university owned, and do something with it. And so you have to bet on your stuff a little bit and you have to sort of say, let's set up milestones that make sense. And if we don't hit them, we will unleash this back to you. And those milestones have been, I think by and large ones that we have knocked out of the park thus far. And I'm a little superstitious, so I'm gonna knock on wood, but we're on track and the relationship with the university is very strong. They've helped us in a lot of ways, everything from PR, to getting access to, to university resources. And so I think it's in any entrepreneur's best interest to look at that negotiation, not as a one-off, you know, I'm going to shoot to kill, but as a let's build the relationship sort of interaction. Thank you for your startup and tech transfer experience, Howard, and we'll, we'll dig a little deeper later, but I'm going to flip it back to Neil. And Neil, I bet you your interaction with numerous entrepreneurs like Howard and the experience you have with a lot of the tech transfer activity at the universities within Maryland while you were at Tedco and some of your other experiences told you what some of the needs were in this entrepreneurial journey that they go through, uh, especially after they just, you know, you when you're trying to marry a good science with good business, and sometimes those two things don't come together. And that's sort of what happened when you had a researcher at the University of Maryland, Baltimore, and Howard came together and both of them had their expertise. So why don't you talk a little bit about the realization you came to about these needs and how that turned into something at the University of Maryland in Baltimore around this entrepreneurial program? Well, you know, it's, it's funny, Rich, when people hear or think about the University of Maryland, Baltimore graduate programs, they think about world-class programs in medicine, 
law, social work, nursing, things like that. But UMB actually has 42 different PhD, master's, and certificate programs. Now, all but 19 of those, those traditional programs, fall in one part of the university. But the contemporary graduate programs, where this certificate in biomedical entrepreneurship falls, is a place where UMB can relatively quickly develop and launch a program that responds to the needs of working professionals or responds to some theme or to some opportunity in the market, right? So this certificate we're talking about today falls into that category, okay? So we did some early customer discovery. You know, we, we kind of follow our own, our own rules, right? And we, we looked at who might be interested in such a 12 credit program. Certainly entrepreneurs who are thinking about licensing and commercializing university IP were one of our target customers or target students. But we also found that graduate students and postdocs who want to better understand what an innovation-based career path might look like would find this certificate interesting. We also noticed and learned that there's been a lot of changing of the guard in Maryland's entrepreneur support organizations. So a lot of new folks, a lot of energy, a lot of new, new faces around, but not all conversant in this tech transfer startup pathway. So we heard that those folks would be interested in this certificate as well. We thought researchers who want to better understand the pathway for commercializing their technology and new tech transfer office professionals who want to better understand the full, the full conveyor belt, so to speak, of taking research from the lab all the way to a thriving startup company would want to have this kind of training. So with those four or five customer segments in mind, we designed this certificate to try and meet those needs. And basically what it does, Rich, it follows research from where it's formed in the lab. And in a series of four courses, it takes that research up to the point where it is licensable. Then it follows it into a startup company. Then it follows it to a growing company. And finally, to a company that wants to monetize itself over the long run, either organically growing or through license or acquisition. So at each one of those four steps, we try and hit the major points, the major pain points, the major challenges, the major issues that someone like Howard has been facing now for a long time and his partner, Stephen. And we try to offer the student greater insight into what's going on on that conveyor belt. We do that using primarily subject matter experts who are interviewed and who present in uh, fireside chat settings along with semester-long projects that the students work on that are driven by an actual piece of research or an actual company. So we try to make it as real world as possible and give the students something to take away from the class and literally use the next day, next week, next month in their, their career path or their sort of journey. And can you explain what a certificate program is versus what traditional educational programs are, Neil? Great question. Certificates are becoming super popular right. around the country. This one and most of the certificates at UMB are what's called stackable. So a student can, can take these four courses, earn 12 graduate credits, and walk away with the knowledge that, that they're smarter, better, and faster than they were before taking the courses. Or if a student wants to pursue a master's degree, these 12 credits can be applied to UMB's master's in health and social entrepreneurship and only then need 24 more credits to receive a full master's degree. So that's what we mean by stackable. And it gives the student the flexibility to choose the path that they need out of UMB. Great. Okay. And we're going to talk a little bit more and do a little deeper dive on the program. But as I'm, I'm going to flip back to Howard again on Coaptech. And Howard, you talked about 
sort of a first time entrepreneur negotiating this license, working with a researcher, when you started to get into this in a deeper way, what skill sets and experience did you realize that you didn't have that needed to be applied that you actually obtained by on the job experience? Okay, this is a great question. And there are a lot of good answers here. But Neil, I think the certificate sounds phenomenal. And I commend you for putting it together. There's so much talent in the academic and scientific worlds in this area, but it is very hard to turn those creations from really meaningful advances into things that change people's lives for the better. It's, it's an art and a science. And from what I can gather about the program, it sounds like you're going to be addressing both of those, which is also fantastic. You know, it's, it's important to have some of the hard you know, stuff that you might get in like business school, slicing and dicing a balance sheet or any of that comes in handy. But entrepreneurship is, I think, a lot about some skills that fall in the middle of, you know, what you might traditionally think of as hard skills and soft skills. Things like networking, things like being able to convey a message that is both technically sound and relatable and understandable. And those skills are hard to find. I think there are a lot of people who are, you know, sort of niched in one area that are great, but to put them together in a way that can be comprehensive is difficult. And I think the certificate sounds like it's going to pursue that in a way that's, I hope, really impactful for some of the innovators in the area, as well as some of the, the young entrepreneurs in the area who are looking to, to grow new ideas from, you know, beyond the garage, right? Ideas are a dime a dozen. I don't want to sound dismissive of, of great ideas, but that that skill set, and especially in this particular sector, in the, the biotech sector, man, it's a tough path. And I think with any sort of program, you know, what you're getting are hard skills. You know, you're getting real deal things that you can take into your work, but you're also getting a network and you're getting a set of credentials that will give you such greater credibility as you go out there and really start connecting your dots. So I think it's phenomenal. I really think it's great. And I wish I'd had that sort of thing at, at the onset. I've had to put my own program together along the way. So one thing that Neil would ask you, which I will, if you were one of the people that was invited to give a fireside chat, what would you basically tell those that you're addressing related to some of the surprises you encountered in going into your entrepreneurial journey? That is a fantastic question. Since we're at the fireside in this uh, hypothetical, you know, we might be having a scotch, we might be getting a little personal. And I would say on a personal level, I have found that the emotional journey has been as interesting as some of the sort of, you know, boxes you check along the way. Because one day you feel like you're going to change the world and you've got the cape on your back. And the next day you feel like this thing's never going to get off the runway. In fact, we might blow up on the runway with all of our investors, you know, watching, you know, it, it, it can get ugly. And so I think that, you know, if we're at the fireside talking to a group of entrepreneurs who are seriously considering this, I would try to steady them in advance for that. And I know that's maybe an unconventional response, but I would just say it is a roller coaster. And the ups are, are a lot of fun and enthralling, and the downs are really terrifying. And you know, you're putting your and your family's you know futures on the line, and you kind of have to do that if you want to succeed at some point. And I think there are, and you may talk about this in your program, Neil. You know, there are ways to dip your toe in the water and then kind of get in up to your knees and then, you know, how, how you stage your, your entry into this space. I shared time at Hopkins and with Coaptech as I got started, but at some point you've really got to walk out on the bridge as you're building it. And that is, that is challenging. So I would actually talk to, to those, you know, potential entrepreneurs about that angle and that side of things. I think everything else you can and you will learn in, in programs and from your from your network and from your mentors. 
but some of it is really having the resiliency to deal with those very tough days or weeks or months or quarters where it just feels like you're not getting anywhere. And it's a, such a non-linear path. I think that's really important to understand. And, and Neil, I hope, you know, there's a diagram in there, you know, somewhere in this program about it's the opposite of a lot of other disciplines. It's completely non-linear. And some of the jumps can be quantum, and, and that's a great thing, but there can be a lot of plateaus. And I would just sort of touch on that, actually, more than anything else. Yeah, the, the words of wisdom you're hearing now are from Howard Carolyn, who is the CEO and co-founder of CoAptap. And now we're going to flip it back to Neil, Neil Davis, the director of post baccalaureate programs in scientific and medical entrepreneurship at the University of Maryland, Baltimore. And Neil... You talk about this being a 12 credit hour course. How long does the course last? And then basically walk us through the cycle of that course and what a student's going to experience as they go through it. Right. So all good questions. First of all, these are, as I said, they're three, each course is three credits, total of 12. That's completed in eight weeks. So a student is that eight eight weeks for each three hours, eight weeks per course or per Per three hours. Gotcha. A student can take at UMB, a student can take two courses in the fall and two courses in the spring because we have a fall A and a fall B semester. Now, of those 19 contemporary graduate programs I mentioned a few minutes ago, all but three are offered completely virtually. And this one is also offered virtually. So this is really important because we don't want this to be necessarily focused solely on UMB technology. We want this to be institution agnostic. So we hope to attract students from across the country and frankly, even around the world if possible. So of those eight weeks, the first session and the eighth session are what we call synchronous. In other words, They're virtual, they're online at a specific time. The other six weeks, two through seven, are asynchronous. So the student can take that that module, we call a class a module, anytime whatsoever during the week. And we have schedules and deadlines throughout the week, but it's not tied to a specific time of the day. So that's we thought that was really important to be able to broaden this out and make it more accessible and more more available to a wide variety of students. So eight weeks each, two courses in the fall, two in the spring, and that can be completed in in that way. Now, each course, as I said before, addresses a specific phase of that startup conveyor belt, right? But there are some common themes that flow through all four courses. For example, funding, very common theme different elements of funding at different stages. Team. Team is really important at all four stages, but as Howard knows, that team morphs as the startup is formed, as it grows, as it matures, as it prepares for exit. So we talk about team in all four courses and how that changes and evolves as the startup grows and becomes more of a significant entity. And then we also talk a lot about customer discovery, because not all research is created equal. Some has tremendous commercial potential, some has less commercial potential. So it's important to realize that at the research stage, but it's also important for the entrepreneur looking to license technology to understand that they need to do some customer discovery to make sure what is being licensed actually has significant commercial potential. So These four courses, we try to make them as real world as possible. We try and make them as interactive as possible. As I mentioned earlier, each of the four courses has a semester long, eight week long project that is in the case of the first class around a piece of university IP. And then in classes two, three, and four around an actual company that the students will work on and prepare some assessments of and plans surrounding. I think we hit a lot of the issues that Howard mentioned. There's some academic learning, but it's a lot of practical, real-world expertise that we hope the courses can streamline 
and make life easier for the student in the long run. Well, let's flip it back to the real world with Howard. And you're living this entrepreneurial dream right now. And where is CoAptap today? And what are the next major milestones you hope to achieve with CoAptap? Thanks, Rich. And one thing, just building on what Neil said before we turn the page is regarding the customer discovery piece. Neil, I think that's such a great feature of that program. It's so vital to go get real insights from potential users, potential customers. We found in our customer discovery that we were right, but not in the way we thought we were. And you know, we started in a different market than we actually ultimately, you know, we're trying to target for that reason. It's not an exercise. I mean, it's a critical skill and it's a critical step in the journey that can save a lot of correction down the road. So fantastic uh, to hear that that's baked in up front. It sounds like it's pivoting. It's called pivoting, right? Well, you know, so customer discovery, I mean, you, you learn, I think, the sort of objective truth about what you subjectively perceive to be, you know, a, a enthusiastic market. And sometimes it's, it's very confirmational, and I think it can help kind of keep your direction on track. And sometimes it will educate you a little bit more than you might have thought, or you've had a biased sample or whatever it might be. And customer discovery just broadly can, you know, kind of help you right the ship. So I, I would say it's a really attractive skill. People pay, you know, tens of thousands of dollars to consultants to help, you know, manage that. And if, you, if you're teaching people how to do that early and often as you go, it's a tremendous asset that they'll carry with them as they grow. In terms of co tech and our journey, you know, I talked earlier about our licensing efforts and, and I didn't get into a couple of the other really tremendous supports we've had in the community. So I'll, I'll touch on those real quick and then I'll talk about what's next. As we launched, as Neil mentioned earlier, the first support we had was from Tedco. And Tedco has been a great partner for us along the way. Uh, we've had a few different grants and investments from Tedco. And Neil, I think we we met through a program called MD Pace, which you were leading at the time also, which, which not only helped us with some funding, but it also helped us with our regulatory strategy. So the money is important as you're getting going, but the strategy and the, you know, the experience that a lot of these programs in the area sort of carry with them is equally, if not more valuable. So in addition to TEDCO, we've worked with the Maryland Industrial Partnership Group, and that is through the University of Maryland system. And that is a set of grants that have been set up to allow you to partner with university researchers to move your work forward in, in any way that might make sense. For us, it was a clinical study. We partnered with the University of Maryland, some of their faculty, and, and have been running a study at the University of Maryland now for some time. And so that program's referred to as MIPS, right? MIPS. Yeah. MIPS. Yeah, MIPS. Very hip, those MIPS folks. It's, okay. it's a great, <laughs> it's a great program. And I mean, just like Tedco, you know, for companies that are ready for it, I think we, I think we had our first MIPS application and maybe our first Tedco application also rejected just soundly, you know, flat out, no, thank you. Try again. And that was such a good thing for our company. It made us think so much harder. It made us get so much smarter. And so, you know, not easy to get any of these, you know, engagements going, but really worth it. And since then, we've also taken advantage of the geography here through a lot of interactions with the FDA. We've now received four NIH grants to the tune of about $4 million in total. And I also should say we've connected with and benefited from a number of investors in the company are actually local clinicians and or med tech entrepreneurs. And so there is a community, an investor community of that type as well. And so, yeah, we've really enjoyed growing up in Baltimore and we're staying in Baltimore for the foreseeable future. We, we really like it here. Currently, our offices and our operations are at a facility called the Launchport, which is sort of a hub for med tech companies and for other growing companies like, like ourselves. We have engineering on site here. We have operations on site here and administrative work as well. And, you know, manufacturing, I think maybe soon to come. So it's, it's a fantastic ecosystem to really dig your toes into. And to date, it's been a privilege to be a part of. So where we're going is 
the future is unwritten, but I can share some good news that we just received today, which is we just became an international company. As of about six hours ago, we, we received our CE mark, which after getting FDA approval in 2019, we've been marketing in the U.S., running studies in the U.S., developing customer base in the U.S. The CE mark allows us to get online in, in the EU. There are a lot of interesting healthcare models over there that may, we hope, but may reward our type of device and our philosophy of medicine being more efficient, being a really good thing. You know, so we're, we're going to pursue sales into the EU over the next year. And, you know, I mentioned earlier, our first device is a device to place feeding tubes. And that's, you know, relatively sort of a right down the middle of the fairway application of our technology. The stomach as a anatomical region is pretty, pretty hardy. You know, it's harder to, harder to hurt it. Feeding tubes are a very healthy market. They apply to a lot of different conditions. So we, we sort of chose that as our beachhead application. But the company is also developing some next generation products for procedures in the airway and the lungs and the pubic region and other, you know, other areas of the body that are a little more fragile. And so the risks are higher, potentially the rewards are higher. And so we're trying to build on what we've created and what so far has had a really nice response from the market. The most validating thing I can tell any entrepreneur is it's really, it's just such a great feeling to talk to doctors in our case, and you know, some might be working with, with other types of clinicians, but doctors who look you in the eye and say, this is going to make my life easier and better. And that is happening now for our company. It's happening all the time. And it's something that is it is incredibly validating and inspiring to keep going through the emotional you know, challenges that I referred to earlier. And so, you know, we're going to keep doing that with, with some other more advanced products and where we wind up. I think the only criteria that we set for ourselves, and we've told this to everyone from the Maryland Tech Transfer Office to our investors, to strategics who have approached us for potential M&A activities, you know, our only requirement here is that this solution actually get to patients. We're a disruptive solution, which means we're, we're changing how medicine is currently done, which means some of the incumbents that kind of you know, control the space we're entering have interest in, in things not changing. And we've had companies approach us and we perceived that their interests were to, the term is buy it to bury it, you know, folks who might want to acquire our technology to put it on the shelf and to not have it change medicine. And, you know, our, our sort of only criteria for success, whatever that might one day mean, whether we become a big going concern or whether somebody else can pick this up and run with it or something, some other option. We want this to reach patients and we're committed to that. It was created by a doctor and a guy whose mom had a feeding tube. I mean, we're pretty committed to that vision. So we will see, but so far so good. I think I knocked on wood earlier, but I'm going to do it again. It's going well. And uh, the CE mark today is, you know, it's definitely a, a cheers. You know, we're not popping champagne at this point, but we're, we're saying cheers. That's a nice milestone. So it's, it's got a lot of room to grow still. And we're going to, we're going to stay in the saddle for a little while longer. Well, Howard, Carolyn, CEO and co-founder of Co-App Tech, congratulations on your success to date. The other thing is also thank you for talking about what a great ecosystem Baltimore and the state of Maryland is to support med tech entrepreneurs and launching and growing their businesses. So we know you're going to be one of the shiny examples of success in a few more years as you achieve some of those milestones you've discussed. So thank you for being on BioTalk. Thank you very much, Rich, for having me and for allowing Co-App Tech some time at the microphone. We're a quiet company. We're, we're just sort of hard at work right now and we're going to stay that way but it's nice from time to time to get to pull up and appreciate things a little bit and we really appreciate having like i said having come up in this area with a lot of support and we're going to close this edition of biotalk with neil davis who's the director of post baccalaureate program at university of maryland baltimore focused on a biomedical entrepreneurship certificate program and Neil, you've got last words. Uh, let's talk to the listeners. Let them know whatever you would like them to know about your new program, when it's going to start, how do they enroll, who do they contact, 
And how do you get going? Well, thanks, Rich, for having us again. It's a great new program. We're really excited about it. There's obviously a web address where people can go to enroll, which should be easily found. I'll put it in the chat if we can somehow get that up on the podcast later on. I do want to leave the listeners with a clear impression that the University of Maryland, Baltimore is really an innovative place. And these contemporary graduate programs that we've been talking about for the past 45 minutes are really exciting. I'll just leave them with two additional examples of what we're doing over there. We have a new master's of science and post-baccalaureate certificate in violence and vulnerability reduction. Huge issue now nationally and indication of how the university responds to these, these new and different themes in the U.S. And we also have a new certificate in global health innovation. It's offered out of Costa Rica, which is a real leader in translating innovative new ideas into their healthcare system. So this is led by Dr. Carlos Guzman and really exciting, really innovative, really different stuff coming out of UMB. And we hope that this biomedical entrepreneurship certificate will be one more feather in UMB's cap. So thanks for having us today. Well, you're welcome. Congratulations on your success with the new programming. And anytime we run into entrepreneurs looking for ways to gain additional experience, have fireside chats with practitioners and successful entrepreneurs, we're going to send them your way. So Neil Davis and Howard Carolyn, thank you very much for being on BioTalk. We'll follow up with you after a couple of years to see how you both have progressed with your respective programs and company. Thank you. Thanks for listening to BioTalk with Rich Bendis. 